This is Tom Curley, or Thomas Curley, whatever you want to call him, Academy Award-winning mixer. I was looking at your IMDb, and it it follows a lot of guys' careers I've seen where they, for like 20 years, they just work on movies that, you know, are either straight to DVD or not many people have heard of or a small TV thing, and then it just mm-hmm. blows up out of nowhere, and they're doing awesome stuff. They're doing, yeah. you know, like Whiplash, for instance. What what would you say was the – I was looking through IMDb, but I guess I want your opinion. Uh, well, your opinion is the most important because it's your career. Um, what, what was, like, that big project where you're like, okay, finally, this is something awesome? Well, I mean, Whiplash was certainly um, the, the linchpin between, like, indie and sort of uh, mainstream theatrical stuff. And I, I still did quite a number of uh, indie films – afterwards as well but um that that's really what sort of set things off and it, it made getting uh like bigger interviews easier and it uh, brought me to having a relationship with a talent agent and stuff like that so you weren't represented until post whiplash right wow well no i mean that that's a true hustle though you got to respect it um so then I, I'm really curious because I, I've only talked to one other person before who has won an Oscar. They weren't on this show, but uh, because I have you now, what, what do you do with your Oscar? Like I, I see the picture of you or, 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 or did you, did you, you got a physical one, right? Like, cause sometimes like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Cause sometimes like, or like you get it and then they take it away or something like that. Doesn't that happen? Um, and they mail it well, back to that, you. That happened. Uh, that happened with the satellite award. Okay. Um, because uh, we we were uh, the three of us were nominated and, and we won that and um, so there's only one trophy though and they told us that um, we could get our own individual trophy if we wanted to pay like eight hundred dollars for it or something but with the Oscars everybody who's who wins gets one okay uh, that's, as far that's as free, far as I know no surcharges that's free. Um, well, it came with a, a set of rules actually, and and it's tech. It's technically um, like it's it's mine, but I can't sell it um, without <laughs> offering it back to them first or something like that. Okay. Um, but if they declined it, you could sell it. Hypothetically speaking, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. What, what would you What would you sell it for if you could put any price on it? Like, if somebody offered you X amount of dollars, you're like, okay, I'm done with this Oscar. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to be in pretty dire straits for something like that. Okay, like like a million dollars, you wouldn't sell it. I don't know. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every man's got a price. Yeah, every yeah, man's right. got a price. No, um, I, I don't. I don't think so right now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, what do you do with your? Do you just like? Do you hang it up somewhere? Did you like use it to make funny social media videos? Like, what? What did, did you? Is it? Did you give it to your parents or something? Like, what? What did you do with it? It's on my bookshelf here in my uh, living room, um, prominently displayed, I guess you could say. But um, the only thing I ever really did with it afterwards is I had a house party, and and it was called the Touch My Oscar Party. Wow, um, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And so, so everybody there got to like hold it, you know. Yeah. So, so um, is that is that past? Is it like plastic painted gold, like a bowling trophy, or is that like real? Oh gold? no, oh no. Well, it's not real gold. It's it's. Uh, it's solid nickel and it's gold plated, um, so it weighs like over fifteen pounds. Okay, have, and, okay. Uh, now I need to the, ask: the, Have you ever lifted with your Oscar? Um, well, I I can lift more than that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm a string baby. But um, I, I I did uh, yeah the the bath actually weighs a little bit more. What's that? Like Twenty? Um, maybe eighteen. I don't know. It's not it's not a big difference, but. It, it it is kind of a funny thing that that it's a little heavier, right? No. So um, with, with with the touch my Oscar party, you you have me on a tangent now. I'm sorry. I I, I swear yeah. we're talking about sound today. I swear. But but the um <laughs> the so okay. So this is something I really got to ask because there's there's definitely this critique of the Oscars of I guess the less polite people where they say oh oh skip art design, skip sound design, skip all those categories. But so I, I guess you know. 
Uh, we know that uh, for an actor or for a director, there's like so much clout with like, oh, winning an Oscar. And it's uh, like, yeah. are there are there like groupies that come for sound designers with or sound mixers when it comes with like like winning an Oscar? Does that does that help you much in your obviously it helps you in your career? But is that is there any sway in your personal life now now that you say you're an Oscar winner? Or is, or is everything pretty much still the same? Not really. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a lot easier to, like I said, to like talk to people about, you know, potential work in the future and stuff like that. And I've had, um, I've had the door open to a lot more things like, like we're doing now, you know, where I get to share my expertise and, uh, you know, talk about the, uh, the parts of the industry that I'm passionate about and things like that. So it, it's it's really made things like that a lot more easy to find, and and uh, it's it's really rewarding that I get to do stuff like that. Um, but I haven't really uh, capitalized on it a whole lot, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's um, fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, all right, let me let me try to transition this into audio. So, with being an Oscar winner. And, uh, you know, obviously there's there's other guys who are nominated. And I guess I I won't say just Oscar winners, but just Oscar nominees, because that's still a very rare class to be in. Uh, And so is what is is there any higher like threshold pertaining to sound? Is there any higher threshold of knowledge that you see the Oscar nominees are in? that you don't see people work most people working indie stuff like reaching or is it just a matter of sort of connections right place right time or is there genuinely sort of like like you mentioned expertise like is that expertise have you had that the whole time and the oscar just made people listen to it or like or do you feel that i don't know like it it enabled you to talk with more people and learn some more awesome stuff like where are we with that um, it's a little column A and a little column B. Um, I, I feel like my, uh, education at the university of Buffalo was, uh, was, was very good and competent and, um, and w- was able to give me a good basis for, uh, you know, progressing through my career, um, with, uh, a good knowledge base. Um, but at the same time, that's not necessarily required to have a successful career uh, in my field or really in, in just about any field in, in filmmaking. Um, however, th- there's a different set of skills that you get from actually working on set for a long time and um, meeting you know, different people that do this kind of work and... and uh, seeing how they approach things and uh there's a lot of little like tricks of the trade and and just sort of uh things that make recording sound for film different than than it is for music or live audio or um even uh stage performances absolutely um so when when you do anything for 5 10 15 20 years there's, um, you know, things that you that you learn that are useful tools, and and then there's things that you learn that are sort of uh, work towards your intuition and uh, just being able to make you a more efficient worker or uh, a uh, person that just knows what the tools are and how they can be used and how they can be exploited. Um, and, and it just, it makes for perhaps like a, a less stressful, um, approach to things or, or, you know, there's less uncertain, less uncertainty in the way that you approach things because you've kind of been there and done that. Um, so then I, I guess, um, let me, or let me structure it a little more concisely. Like, what okay. is some so as far as guys who you know serious industry dudes always doing features always doing this always doing that versus the guys yeah. maybe sometimes you know scraping to get you know a, a you know a micro job on a big picture or mostly doing smaller pictures that end up on maybe Netflix or or, or 
I don't know, even cartoons, Crunchyroll, whatever. I guess, what's one piece of knowledge that you see the Academy Award guys, or, you know, that level, that feature film guys, what's a piece of knowledge that you see them hit correctly every time, or a technique you see them hit correctly every time, and then just something on sort of the lower payrolls that, that guys keep missing that maybe holds them back? I guess it would be along the lines of knowing how to just sort of predict the future in ways that make you able to be prepared for, uh, for changes. And, um, and also the way that you communicate with, um, the, uh, the higher ups, you know, the creative, uh, people, I see. um, and being able to like speak their language and, um, understand, what their priorities are at any given time. So I I guess, uh, ultimately like situational awareness is, is really, um, kind of a thing. Yeah. Like, um, cause something that I, I see a lot of, uh, young people and, and I myself was, was certainly guilty of this as well is, um, there's uh there's a level of idealism and a level of sort of wanting to prove your worth and your competency that um sort of makes people like hypersensitive to their own to the needs of their own craft and um and a lot of and like not just in sound uh you know camera and lighting and oh, everything set deck all that stuff people yeah. hyper focus on their own craft and they want to stand out and they want to be like the best and they want to get praise from the producers and directors and stuff. And, and it's competitive and that's all well and good. Um, but at a certain point, um, th- there's a, a professionalism that allows everyone to, uh, not only do their own best work, but also to uh, enable the rest of the crew to do their own best work as well. And and not only that, but champion that as well. And I think that's that's when um, like uh, a crew can really shine and and makes something better than the sum of its parts. I say, I I think I might have an example of what you're talking about because I I feel like I know what you're saying where it's it, it's guys who read a lot but maybe don't have the most production experience, uh and this is this is like college age people I'm talking about here but like something yeah. that I, something that I see is like, I'll give you one example so let's say there's no pop filter or something like that. this is more of a studio setting this isn't so much a field thing but let's say there's no pop filter around or every time the actor. Uh, you know, does a P or a T sound, it, it still gets a bit of that plosive, you yes. know, and, and so like, let's say, you know, what I see a lot of engineers do is they'll just off axis the microphone just a little bit, or they'll have, they'll have the talent speak off just a bit just to avoid yes. that plosive. Cause that's a big problem. But then what I see the newly read nitpicker, he he'll come in and, and and he'll be like, uh, oh well, well, you lost all your high end while doing that, and it's like, like, dude, right. you know, it's like, like, dude, no one can tell, like, or, or you can bump that up like just a little bit on on the console, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. Would it's, you say that's an example? It's funny you say that because uh, I I did that literally four days ago. <laughs> oh, you, you did the off axis to save a plosive? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it was with Thank Ryan you. Gosling. We were we were doing uh, wild lines for uh, this movie called The Gray Man. And it was exactly that. Like I, I didn't bring a, a pop filter with me, and I had a, a Shure SM7 microphone set up with blankets around it, and it was just kind of an onset thing where they do wild lines that they just want to throw in for editing purposes, and they'll probably ADR it in a booth later. But yeah, um, there he was speaking his lines, and every time he said a P, it was a nice fat little pop in there. And uh, I tried explaining it, and the, and everybody just kind of looked at me. So I got up and just moved the mic a little bit, and it was fine. <laughs> All right, you um, know, you have no idea how happy that makes me because I have been trying to tell people that they don't necessarily need a pop filter for years, and they tell me I'm an idiot. And then <laughs> it, it's not to call you a name dropper, but you you drop in the name Ryan Gosling. Yeah, I did this with this guy. <laughs> All right, yeah. okay, I'm insane. All right, so let's keep going here. You're familiar with uh, Chris Lord Algae? Not off the top of my head, no. So 
It's so he's a he's a music mixer guy. Like he is one of the big he like I don't know. He feels like the Michael Jordan of of, of like uh, I guess rock engineers, uh, yes. at least in the contemporary era. And so he's done uh, Green Day, American Idiot. Like he's done so many uh, big albums. And it seems like he's kind of the face for for sound mixers and sound mixing education for music. But it feels like by comparison, the 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 mixing community for for, you know, audio for video or, or, you know, motion picture sound. It feels like it's it's so tiny compared to the music field. Um, yeah. and, and I don't know why, I guess to you, who is the Chris Lord algae of, of mixing for motion pictures earlier on? There was, uh, Jim Webb. He was, uh, Robert Altman's, uh, production mixer and, and sort of one of the first people to really master multi-track location recording and, uh, heavy wireless use and time code and all kinds of things like that, that we all use today. Um, but then, but then there's the uh, sound design side of it too, and the post production, which is you know every bit as important as the foundation that we record. How much, uh, um, re- real quick? How much? Uh, yeah. How much background do you have in post and ADR and all that stuff? Because I had a few questions about that as well, but I don't know how much I should get into them. Uh, I've never done it as a profession. You know, I've never really like done really much more than spend uh, a little bit of time sitting in on some sessions that have been done on stuff that I've worked on and uh, you know visited a couple other uh, pros and and sort of picked their brain about stuff um, the cinema audio society has been pretty good about having like seminars where they sort of um, bridge the gap um, with uh, production and post-production because a, a lot of times we really don't talk at all. And uh, that that's kind of a shame because um, right. a lot of times uh, a lot of confusion could be cleared up with uh, just a little bit of communication in either direction. So, I mean, as far as um, like the, the people that are influencers and stuff, like it, it's hard for me to say uh in the post world but uh certainly craig Mann and, and uh ben wilkins the the guys that i did whiplash with are, are uh doing a lot of uh great things these days and um and they certainly both have really bright features in the sound design world um uh wiley statement uh just recently won uh the emmy for uh uh the queen's gambit yeah, and that that was a really good, uh, you know, achievement in sound design for sure. Um, and that's the other thing is like TV and film are sort of these two sort of like heavily related, but but not quite adjacent <laughs> worlds, yeah. you know. So there's there's a lot of good work being done all over the place, um, and that's another thing that that a lot of people kind of get caught up in is I, I don't really see the film world or the television world as kind of a contest that can really be quantified because it's all subjective and uh, it's all this sort of weird blending of art, science and business. Well, that actually, Um, that actually brings me to something sort of a real pressing thing where it comes with the opinion of the sound, you know, the, the field recordist who's actually there uh, versus the guy in post who has to sort of, I guess, bring the orchestration together. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, th- so so I do a lot of sound design, and there is always this battle in my mind where for, for any given sequence, any given scene, whether it's a punch, whether it's somebody taking their jacket and, and going over to the door or anything like that, you know, mm-hmm. what is what is the balance in a sound designer's mind like wh- what should they manage in terms of realism versus creativity like where should they usually draw the line because you know anybody in sound design they know like you know you could either do two sound effects where it's it's mic'd realistically and you're and you're going mm-hmm. full realism or you could do whoosh, throw in 50 hertz of bait you could do the whole thing you know so i guess right where, where's that line for you well for me what i always try to do is get as clear of dialogue as we can, and then also express as much of what's going on in front of the camera as possible, because I, I don't want to, uh, to leave post-production short, you know, and, and I, I want them to have as much of a canvas to work with 
as I can give them in a practical sense. So there's kind of a um, an unspoken trust between the post production people and and the production people that like I'm I'm trusting them to to make the most out of what I give them, and they're trusting me to give them something that they can work with. Um, and so if, since since we don't actually communicate a lot, that's kind of uh, the unspoken relationship. And I, I always just try and fulfill that as, as best as uh, I can between the challenges of, of production and the, the wants and needs of uh, the, you know, above the line people. And then as far as like what to do on any given film, I think that would be, sort of a conversation it'd be a creative decision between the director and uh what the script says and um you know what you have to work with and what you're able to to do with it um i i guess i more so like i i you know i'd like your opinion you're probably watching at least some movies right uh oh yeah are, are there are there moments where you're like, oh my god, that was so annoyingly overdesigned. They put way too many effects that wasn't necessary. Like, because I mean, you're a sound guy. Like, do you? Right. Are, are there moments where you roll your eyes at like some overdesigning of a moment? The, for the most part, I try and go with what they're giving me. Um, but but when it comes to like, I don't know, like the Transformers movies are pretty offensive. Um, in terms of what? In terms of the sound design. Okay. Um, you know, like the Transformers movies are, I mean, it's Michael Bay, so there's that. And I mean, he's known for being sort of audacious with everything, you know, the visuals and the sound and the stunts and all that stuff. But um, I, I try and give them the benefit of the doubt that they that they're giving me what they intend to give me. So I just I try and um, sort of see if there's anything there really that that's uh distracting me enough that takes me out of it then i then i would be uh complaining about that but where would you um, say where would you say it's over design because I, I mean i'm going off of just a memory of transformers from years ago that i saw it but you know there is definitely the potential to under design when you have a car turned into a person <laughs> you know like and so, so you right. need a lot of sounds there i guess um, what are moments in there where you're like uh, you know that those all the sound was not needed well, there's no perspective um, in in the uh, and there's no sense of scale in those movies. It sounds like every thing from uh, a cat's meow and a uh, you know a, a spent bullet shell hitting the floor, all the way up to a giant laser blaster or a battleship hitting a building. Like they're all the same level. No, and they're all the same. There, there's um it's all loud all the time and there's no um sense of like uh presence within the space like they show these huge giant wide shots of all this stuff happening and like optimus prime is talking and it still sounds like it's like inside your head um it doesn't sound like it's 100 feet away and um there's 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 ways to do that sonically with the with the sound design to make like um, to make it still audible, you know, and uh, and easy to interpret as speech, but also sound like it's coming from a uh, 80 foot tall robot that's that's 100 feet away inside of a inside of a metro cityscape, you know. Um, they they've abandoned all sort of sense of sonic reality with stuff like that so it, it just becomes like a cartoon in a certain way where where it's you know the the dialogue might be the only thing that's ever actually recorded live and literally everything else is constructed from nothing um and so i guess like and and it also sort of takes the approach of like um more is more and even more than that is better uh, you know so it just yeah. becomes ex it, it becomes exhausting uh to me anyway um i i i uh i find that with any movies um you know w when they have uh like sort of a balance of uh highs and lows it, it's it's sort of a more 
enjoyable experience really did you, um did you feel that way with uh kill bill because i remember kill bill also did sort of that very over the top like i remember there was knife whooshing sounds when they didn't even make sense uh, i'm not sure if right. you remember that like did you feel that, well, that like, kind of with that too there, well see this there's an interesting thing with that though where it's it's almost portrayed as a comic book type of a a world, you know, like there's, there's lots of cinematic things that they do in that movie that sort of take you out of reality. And, and like, you know, a lot of the like sort of Kung Fu style, like zoom in on the eyes and like, you know, all, all that sort of like crazy stuff that he does. Like, well, in fairness, it, make, it makes it less real. So, you know, it's, in, in it's more of a fantasy. To, in fairness to Transformers, I mean, I don't know when we're going to see a hundred foot robot, but well, no, I mean, I but, get what you mean—the the, the missing son or, or whatever it is, right? Yeah, exactly. And okay. and the, um, see, so there's a the Transformers are portrayed in the movie as real things, though, yeah. and um, you know, like uh, the, there's no yeah. sort of um, level of of uh, fantasy there. You know, it's just like these are things. This is what's happening. Like these buildings are really falling down. You know. Um, th- there's a little playfulness in uh, in Kill Bill that that sort of goes along with that. That kind of um, you know that, that's why that's why I say that it's like an individual creative decision with with how to go on these things. Like there, there's a, an incredible movie that that came out this year um, called The Killing of Two Lovers. Yep. Which um, is a, it's a low budget indie drama. Um, about this relationship falling apart between these two people in the small town. And it's one of the most brilliant uses of sound design I've seen in a long time. And there's a lot of stuff in that where all you hear is all this random ambience happening around this guy. You hear everything from like the coolers running at the convenience store and like, you know, crusty exhaust on cars driving by and like kids playing and dogs barking and like planes flying overhead and just, just all the random stuff that happens in life. And like the soundscape that they created there um, tells as much of a story, uh, if not more than what you're seeing. And it, it really builds up like the, uh, claustrophobia out in the wide open spaces that this guy is feeling as his like life is uh, collapsing around him. Right. And they use all kinds of things in that sound design. Like uh, when people are far away, they sound like they're far away. Like they keep the camera in a car with this guy while he sees his wife arguing with her new boyfriend across the street. And like, they just stay on him and focus on him. And you, you can hear them saying stuff, but you can't really make out what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's, there's all kinds of cool things that can be done like that. If the, uh, the will is there and the, um, you know, sort of forethought to, uh, make those things matter exist, you know, and, and sometimes it, it's, uh, comes from discussion and sometimes it comes from discovery. Um, you know, some, some of these things are, are found out in, in the, uh, in the mix booth. Crack it one open. Um, uh, it's a seltzer water, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was like, nah, it's okay. Well, th- that's 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 one of those things that kind of makes this such an interesting field is that it, it's it's always a creative process, and that process can be um, you know pre-planned or or it can happen organically, and uh, it, it's different each time. It depends on the people that are involved each time. And uh, I think that's why when some of these auteur filmmakers find people that they really like working with, they, they tend to stick to them. So speaking of organic, uh, obviously being uh, being out in the field, you cover all the organic sound. Everything you do is organic. Uh, yeah. But there's there's one sort of, I guess, floating thing around. And I, it depends on genre probably the most. But um mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of people who go to media schools and, and, you know, this, you know, these numbers have been thrown around for the last 10 years and I've just gathered stuff from places all over. And it's about when we watch a movie, the the percentage of, of how much ADR or how much of those of the sound has been entirely just built up in a studio as opposed to out on the set. And um, mm-hmm. I, I guess just so and obviously budget is going to have something to do with it in addition to genre. But I, I guess yeah. what percent 
I'll, I'll do it like this. What percent of the hundred million dollar films are ADR versus what percent of ADR for the low budget films are TV? Like, so if you were to put a, you know, a number on that, on that big budget stuff, that Marvel, that, you know, Batman, that stuff, like what percent mm-hmm. would you reckon is that versus the percent on a, a film like uh whiplash or, or, you know, or Yellowstone or, or, you know, something that you, you've worked on with not $200 million to throw around. Right. Um, well, in, in general, the answer is usually as little as possible, but, um, with, uh, with things like, um, you know, the Avengers and end game and all that stuff, it tends to be much higher. It tends to be more along the 80 to, you know, 70, 80%. Um, and sometimes even higher depending on circumstances. I mean, I, there's a, a movie was... called Hard R- Rain um, that I, I uh, a colleague of mine worked on years ago, and and it was yep. about this like sort of uh, suspense thriller that happens during a hurricane, and uh, they had practical rain on this set all the time, and I they ADR'd you know all of that movie, but there was a reason for it, right? Um, and uh, but like. Yeah, the, definitely. The 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 lower the budget, the more it becomes uh, a, kind of an important factor. Yeah. Um. You know, because nobody wants to pay for something like that unless uh, unless it's going to make things easier for them. And and I think uh, when it comes to these giant budget movies, um, it's it's such a small expense to them at that point that the cost of not continuing to move on with the schedule is probably less than it is to ADR it. And, um, and I think it's, it, it becomes purely like kind of a financial thing at that point that like, they'd rather just keep the show going than, than do another take because there was a plane. So what, what percent would you throw? So we, we had maybe uh 70 to, to maybe even a hundred with the high budget stuff. Yeah. you could throw a number percent for the for the low budget stuff or you know sort of the 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 one um, to ten million dollar stuff where, where would you put it it could still be very high okay. but on average i would say it would be much lower like um zero to twenty percent zero to twenty okay fair enough yeah no, uh, our, I, I was uh i was wondering earlier uh did you see um uh the peter jackson king kong movie uh yeah so I I was told that that was 100% ADR. Um, yeah, I believe it. Yeah, there there was something about that, which is, which is incredible to me is that they sit there and they build that entire thing all over again after shooting. Like there's there's a or, or wasn't there something about like all of the original like black and white film like when they first did Sync Sound like wasn't all of that ADR back in the day or something like that because the lights made so much noise that they had to go to a booth or something like like I feel like I heard that somewhere before. I, I don't know if you heard that. I I can see. That that is a possibility for some films, but I, I know um, that uh, that there was plenty of like real production sound being uh, distributed at that point. Um, right. But but it was it was still kind of an experimental um, endeavor for a while, and uh, I mean, well, it was actually um, the second film that uh edison ever shot to my knowledge was uh was sync sound and um at the time it was such a laborious process that that, that they didn't see it as practical and so it took another 35 years or so before it became practical but they, they were always kind of working on it I'll throw out one uh, ADR thing to you because um, this is yeah. something that I see a lot of people struggle with. I, some days I struggle with it. Just just one ADR thing, one one little nugget here. Uh, tackling a certain task. Any tips you have for someone? Uh, how does someone make a a rural ADR for for an outdoor sort of scene? How do they make that voiceover sound good? Like, what should the mic placement be? What should they do on the mix? What should they do on the reverb? Because there's this methodology where, oh, if it's not if it's outside and there's no walls to bounce off of, you just leave it completely dry. But at the same time, that you know, a lot of times when you when you, you know when you're dubbing that in, it, it just sounds dead, as opposed to as opposed to dry right. and unassumed. So I guess 
uh, like I have my own methodology for it, but I, I wanted to hear yours as far in regards to just that task. So ADRing uh, a guy outside two feet from the camera. Um, I guess mm -hmm. how, what are your tips for making that sound uh, Hollywood, as they say, or whatever? Huh. Well, it's it's not something that I that I've really ever been tasked with uh, achieving after the fact, because I mean, usually, like if we're shooting outside, then then we're just shooting outside, and that's right. that. So creating that in a studio environment um, would involve, I mean, I guess there wouldn't be much in the way of reverb, but they're, they're um, but it's not completely dead. Yeah. I, I mean, you, adding in. Because um, that outdoor. A, 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 like a, a ambience of some kind is, is certainly going to be a factor there, like a, a sort of base level hiss kind of for just atmospheric purposes. Right. Um, but as far as like the, the nitty gritty things like EQ and delay and stuff, I, I, I wouldn't really uh, have like boots on the ground knowledge about how to accurately describe that. I see. Yeah, no, because I um, figured, um, what's it called? Because I, I, sometimes I try to ask the guy on the other side of it when he watches a movie, and they're because you know we've probably heard tons of bad ADR, of course. Like we know it immediately yeah. as soon as we hear it. Uh, I think, um, like like in the Goonies, we heard that in uh, a lot of '80s movies. Rocky, like Rocky Five, I think was another one where they're getting off the mm -hmm. plane and their their lips are like on the microphone, <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. Well, yeah, that that that's kind of yeah, that, that's that happens uh, with a lot of things. So I guess, yeah, backing away from the microphone for uh, for outdoor shots probably would be kind of a good idea, especially if it's like a wide shot. Um, then I would say even get like uh, some sort of a shotgun microphone and have them try it from like five feet away and see how that sounds. Right, yeah. No, because we're also in this uh, era, I mean, I mean post-COVID, like, there's a lot of people I've seen do ADR now from home. And yeah. uh, we have a lot of home studios, and the problem that I see is that we're stuffing everybody in their closet booths, that which are, you know, three by three. There's no mm -hmm. room for acoustics to make that even remotely feel like it's outdoors. And right. it's, it's sort of a... Uh, th that's kind of the problem we're in, and, and I guess... When I when I spoke and and I I was talking about you know trends with the with the mixing industry so to speak in terms of uh, you know audio for either film or cartoons or games or anything because I I sort of have a more uh, do you do uh, do you ever do uh, games or anything like that or are you strictly film because I'm more uh, multimedia I I'm open to it but it's never really come across my desk I see. Um, yeah, and I, I know some people that do do a lot of that work, um, but um, I, I I was thinking back to your your uh, your exterior thing there, and I was thinking it, it might not be a bad idea if somebody wants to try um, actually just recording outside, and um, I mean you would have to find an environment that's uh, that's suitable, you know, something that's not like on a busy street and, you know, I mean, like go to a, a farm or something somewhere where you can get a little peace and quiet, but, uh, recording outside, you know, I, I do it all the time and all you really have to do is make sure that your microphone is uh, wind protected and that you're not getting rained on. Um, Oh no, see that's that's actually a big question I've had cuz I've I've had these I've had these strange fantasies of an outdoors rec recording booth where mm -hmm. somehow is there anything cuz cuz I've never done it on a on any kind of high budget capacity um but it, is there like are, are I guess are there um giant instead of putting like you know the dead cat on the microphone are there uh sort of giant wind nets like like is that a, is that a common thing for uh no. For field recording no no okay um pretty much just blimping the microphone is is uh all that i've really seen um and uh i mean uh, you could have uh grips put up some c stands and some furniture pads you know and stuff like that yeah um but if you're recording outside, that's that's one of those things where sort of um, 
you're you're losing the element of control that the studio provides so you're at the mercy of nature in one way and you're at the mercy of circumstance uh partially being like if if you didn't choose the location you're showing up to record what's happening there um and that might you know that might not be everything that you want you know they they call chicago the windy city uh maybe as a sound recordist this is important to you what's the least windy place on earth or sorry, in America, I'm not going anywhere on Earth, just America. <laughs> but wait, is huh. there is there like a city for? Because we say we call Chicago the windy, windy city, and like the Midwest is right. windy. But like, I'm trying to figure out what what are the non windy places? Because that'd be a cool place to to try that, you know? Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's there's wind pretty much everywhere. Maybe a uh, forest. <laughs> a forest? No, because yeah. the wind blows against the trees, and then it gets on your it gets on your track. Right. right. So, yeah. So I mean. Um... <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like you're at the mercy of of nature at that point. So, you know, go to a big open uh, field somewhere and uh, do it when it's nice out. And that's pretty much all you got, you know. Um, Pray to the wind gods. All right. And um, don't be afraid to do it again if it fails. You know, there's... um, That's one of those things, like, if you're doing it on your own time, you can can sort of... uh, you, you know, call it practice. And, uh, that that's when it's okay to screw up. That's when it's okay to have problems and, uh, you know, figure it out. Um, are you, are you one of these, uh, c- cause I see this sentiment. I'm not sure if it, it's hard to find sound guys. I'm going to be honest. And so you're, you're probably the most hmm. accomplished sound guy that I've run into. Just like, I, I don't, I've run into a hundred camera people. It feels like with camera, there's like such a community and you can find anybody with sound. It feels like, it's I don't know it feels like the void like you try to find help and there's just like nothing in terms of uh, yeah. stuff for movies and so I guess are are you one of the sound dudes who because I see this sentiment a lot in regards to looking at ADR and they people so many people purely look at ADR as this oh it's just fixing it in post and my thing is like it, I mean if you try to sit there and try to EQ and try to put on a bunch of plugins to me that's fixing it in post. But like, I mean, the process of ADR and and looping and Foley, like that's not, that's not just a post thing to me. I mean, what, what say you? Everything involved in this process um, is a tool. And, and each of these tools has things that they're good at and things that they're, you know, they're capable of, of doing really great things for the end product when they're used properly. And, um, so knowing that, um, knowing all the tools in our box and knowing how they're used and how they can be exploited is the best way to, um, to know when you need them and, and, you know, how to successfully employ them. And, uh, so, you know, knowing all the stuff that I use in, in my work on set, is one part of it, but then knowing what can be achieved later um, can alleviate, you know, uh, worried conversations on set sometimes. Like if, you know, if, if I know that these guys are, are all shooting machine guns while having a conversation, it's probably not going to be the best recording that I can get no matter what I do. (laughs) So, you know, I, I can confidently tell the, uh, the director or the producer, whoever is asking that we're going to record what we can and it'll be good enough to use for a guide track in ADR, you know, and that that's really the only way around it unless you start using fake guns that, that don't have blanks in them, you know, and um, sometimes that actually happens as well. So if you're involved enough in uh ahead of time that you can get around those things and not need it then then that's one thing but if if that's what you're being presented with then um you know you should know enough that that that's that's what can be done to fix it and uh, and it's going to be all right in the end you know it's it's a means to an end yeah so I guess uh, I want you to sort of be my audio guy therapist here because uh, there's there's sort of this existential crisis I've been having with 
my tastes versus what's objectively correct versus what is getting worse in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I'm having this crisis where, so I, I've only been, I, I mean, how long have you been at sound design? Like, like, like 20, 30 years now? It's uh well, 20, I did my first movie 20 years this coming February. So, okay. So 20 years. Yeah. So, yeah. so I've only been in it for, I would say maybe uh, like actually trying at it for maybe only six or seven years. And Uh I, you know, about, I would say maybe five years into that, I I started really developing, uh, and this is not just like, you know, sound recordist on set, but it just um, like post sound design, just everything, building soundscapes, all of that. And my goal was always to recreate or have the same level of the stuff that I grew up on. That was always my goal. So I, I would never look to, oh, look at this indie film, look at this. I would always try to look at the best possible thing, and that would be sort of uh, my my metric for how I should do. And so five years into that, I I, I would sort of uh, – I developed my own methodology. I developed my own taste. I developed all this and that. And then I would, you know, I, I would have, like, this very strict way of doing my work. And then I would go and watch just random movies here and there. And I'm like, they did that? You know, like sort of modern movies, like 2015, 2020 movies. Uh, uh-huh. I guess around there. And now Whiplash was wonderful. I'm not saying Whiplash. But, you know, there's some there's some movies there in that mid-budget range. An example is, is like, um, uh, the, did you see the Lego movie by any chance? Are you an adult? Or... Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so with the Lego movie, there was some that annoyed me where they, they I felt like they had the actors – way too close to the mic and i felt mm-hmm. like they they didn't put any wetness on any of it it just felt way too dry for a lot of it from the clips i was seeing and so i i got into this existential crisis where have i just created my own methodology and this just doesn't match my taste and it's actually okay or is there is there some quality being lost and then i would go back and i would look at cartoons and i would look at movies that i saw you know, when I was a kid, you know, closer to sort of 20 years ago, and it all sounds, it, it, it sounds fine. I'm like, wow, that sounds really great. That sounds better than anything I could do. And so mm-hmm. I, I guess, like, d- did you ever face that crisis where you're like, what, what, you watch other things, you're like, what are my tastes versus what is actually correct? Are, are there a lot of people doing stuff wrong now? Help me out with this, because it's it sort of, I don't know, it, it, it's very confusing coming up. Yeah, the short answer is yeah. Uh, yeah, th- there's always kind of uh, a struggle, I guess, between your own personal ideology and like what you're being paid to do. And um, I mean, th- th- there's um, a weird thing that nostalgia does that that makes things possibly better than they really were. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, and like certainly, like I mean, I grew up watching uh, like He Man and and Transformers and GI Joe and all that stuff, and like watching the the Knight Rider TV show and uh, Airwolf and stuff like that. And like seven year old, eight year old me thought those things were the, the most awesome things that have ever existed. And now when I look at it, it's it's kind of you know trash. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is this so, is what's uh, weird though. Is um, like I'll go back to just a quick sidestep. Um, I'm yeah. sure you remember when the Pokemon movies were coming out in theaters. Uh-huh. I I would go back to that. The Pokemon movie with one third of the budget of the Lego movie. Yeah, I watched that movie. It sounded way better. And I'm not going to ask you to go back and watch the Pokemon movie and the Lego movie. I'm not I'm not going to put you through that. But but like yeah. that's that's what I heard as an adult re-listening to it. It's not like, "Oh, this right. was actually bad." I was like, "Wow, that still sounds good." Right. Hmm. Um well, I mean, it, it's it's hard to say. Uh I mean, a lot's changed, you know, every every couple of years with all the uh, you know, plugins that come out and the machines that come out and um there there's also things that are like uh like fads. I mean, if you think visually like when the bullet time thing first came out, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, like every, everybody went crazy yeah. for that, you know. Yeah. And um you know, so there's certainly like uh trends and things like that 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 take over and um a lot of times like people that maybe don't know any better tend to just follow things like that so um sometimes 
you know, if if you feel like you're about to like uh, violate some personal, you know, credo or something, you, you could suggest it to the people that you're working with and, and see what their opinions are on it. I mean, I, I always feel like um, like stuff like that. If your uh, professional equals, you know, working in the same room and on the same project together, you should be able to at least bring it up as a conversation and, and see what what their opinion is on it. And hopefully they'll respect what your opinion is on it. And, and um, you know, then maybe you could, uh, you know, be a uh, a merchant of change, so to speak. Yeah. I guess so a, a part two to that question where we talk about generational decline, I guess, of quality, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. I still don't know. But uh, I guess, so this is something in the camera department. A lot of film guys versus digital guys. There, mm-hmm. there are so many film guys who say digital sucks, not necessarily because it, it looks worse, but because it's creating undisciplined cinematographers. It's creating undisciplined yeah. cameramen. It's creating... Um, right. Uh, nobody lights anymore. Like I was talking to, uh, I bought a bunch of grip equipment off of a uh, a guy who did Zombie Honeymoon and Rescue Nine One One. He did all these shows in the seventies, and yeah. uh, he was selling all of his stuff, all his tungsten stuff, because he's like, people don't actually light anymore. Like the craft of lighting right. for real is dead, and so. But, but that's because film was very not sensitive, and so they needed all that light. So let's bring right. it to sound here. Do you feel that the 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 new digital wave? I guess that would be in like ninety five somewhere around there. Um, yeah. You know, do you think that created that influxed a bunch of non disciplined sound people the same way film did it with uh, digital imaging? Um, to a certain degree, yes. And you could include me in that world because um, I mean I didn't grow up in a studio. I I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to make a good album or how to, uh, you know, really, uh, sound design a movie that was shot on 35 or any of that kind of stuff. However, the thing that a lot of those people are sort of quietly bitter about is that this is an industry and not just an art form. And that if it were just an art form, you know, decisions would, would be made differently, but, but we're making a product to be consumed and it's, uh, it's something where the, the choices that are being made to, uh, to sort of what technological, uh, means we use are, aren't necessarily up to us. So, um, I mean, I know quite a few people that quit the business at the end of the nineties when, when, shows wouldn't hire them unless they could shoot digital or record digital. And, um, a lot of people at that point just threw their hands up and said, well, forget it then I'm out. And, um, they must've been rich. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, perhaps, um, yeah. And well, that, that's another thing though, is that, so this transition to digital, it wasn't the cleanest transition. Let's be honest. You know, I mean, there were growing pains, but they've come a long way and, a lot of the advances that we've seen in the last 20 years are in good faith trying to make things better, you know, and I think they've done that. Um, I mean, I, we, we can shoot beautiful looking images and record really complex, really awesome sounding stuff now and, and do it fast and relatively cheap. And, yeah. uh, that, that, that's not something that was practical or possible 30 years ago with, without, you know, extreme measures being taken. So in a way it's, it's opened up the, uh, the ability for people to be more creative with less means, but that also unfortunately comes at the cost of also allowing people that don't have the best uh intentions or the best uh vision to also enter that arena and so you know we we allow a lot more people in that have the ability to make great things and uh you know at the same time we have to weed through a little more prep i'm sort of wrapping up here we're winding down but sure piece of audio gear you hear a lot about you see a lot of uh i guess random people talk about on youtube that you find overrated um for production work 
uh, I would say the the theater noise reduction system. Okay. Um, and that that's something that existed exclusively in post for a long time. It was a. Are, are you familiar with Cedar? Uh. No, not cedar. I, I mean, I have a I have a bias against uh, noise reduction uh, sort of units in general. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, go ahead. Well, so I mean, for a long time, it, it was a analog thing. It was a very um, specific and sort of persnickety process that people had to you know be trained for, and and it was uh, you know expensive and took a long time and. But it, it was the kind of thing that could save you from a plane flying past if, uh, you know, if you want, if you really wanted to save that take. Then, yeah. You know, um, since then, they've they've come out with digital versions of it and plug-in versions of it. But they also have a uh, a sort of location-friendly one now that's like thirty five hundred dollars or so. But but you can add cedar noise reduction to your onset tracks and. Uh, it's kind of like uh, bringing isotope out into the field with you. Um, and, and that's something that I've seen a lot of people make a lot of noise about here in the last year or two. Um, but, I, but I don't think it's really our place to, to do that in the field. Uh, I think we should be turning in. Uh, I mean, they still do turn in raw recordings, but like it shouldn't be expected of us to turn in a processed track. Right. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, I go crazy. No, because I'll work with voiceover people and they'll put all their plugins on and I'll tell them the raw. They think I can't tell the difference. It gets really annoying. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> last thing, uh, I was looking at your IMDb real quick. Uh, I always try to find a fun title. Any memories, uh -oh. any memories doing dance flick with the Boyans brothers? Oh, so, um, yeah, that was a one day gig for me. Okay. I, I was I was uh, working as a utility person for the mixer Kim Ornitz, and uh, I, I had been mixing quite a bit at that point, but not on like big big movies. And that was kind of a big, you know, bigger budget Wayne's Brothers movie. It never really went anywhere, but um, but I, I was only there for one day, and uh, everything was going great for us. And uh, he was recording on that tape which was still kind of prevalent you know it was kind of, it's, it was on its way out but that's what a lot of people still used and yeah we were wrapping up at the end of the day and this guy had a huge rig it was very heavy and um as the utility i was i was in charge of like pushing everything back onto the truck i was also supposed to turn in the sound tape at the end of the day to uh to be delivered to post and um i got so busy putting everything back on the truck. And then once the last piece was loaded, the boom operator and the mixer were uh, shaking hands and, you know, talking about going to the bar and stuff. And we all just walked away to the parking lot. And uh, it wasn't until 15 minutes down the road that I got a phone call saying, Hey, where's the sound tape? And uh, it turns out that I had like left it on the set um, and, and never turned it in. So, so did you get uh, in trouble? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I never worked with that guy again, so. Did you get paid? Um, yeah, yeah, you always get paid. What, what, what did you get um, paid? What did you get paid after making that mistake, though? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that, that's that's kind of the nice thing about being on a union production yeah. is like that that stuff's already <laughs> sorted. So, I mean, I, I I was getting like twenty five bucks an hour or something like that as a utility. So, I mean, I, I got paid whatever we worked that day, which was like eight or ten hours. So. Uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks. That's pretty good. A couple hundred bucks for that mistake. No, I'm just kidding. The, uh... yeah, well, honestly, the lesson was, was more valuable, really. Were you doing a scene where uh, the Wayans brothers are actually performing, or was it just sort of a second unit thing? Um, no, it was... Uh, well, I think they were at the monitors for what we were shooting. It was like... It was a song with... Um, I think it was Keenan Ivory Wayans as a, a principal character it was like a high school musical kind of a thing okay and and he was a he was a huge huge fat guy that was in like an inflatable suit okay and and we were doing a, a musical scene with him singing about food and and overeating and stuff like that wow. um 
Yeah, that that was. Uh, we <laughs> might have done a couple other like pickup shots and stuff, but I think it was reshoots. Did, did um, the Wayans brothers acknowledge you in any way? No. <laughs> You'll get them next no, time. I mean, yeah, you when you're next doing time. utility work like that, that's that's not really part no, of I, the I, deal, really. No, I know. It, it was just, no. I mean, acknowledge is in like like you bump into them accidentally, and they're like, "Oh, sorry," like or something like that. That's what I meant. But no, um, not 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 that I recall. No. Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess like who, who to this date, like who's the who would you say is like the biggest star you've worked with at this point? I mean, the last few years have really been kind of a, a who's who. Um, I mean, like I mentioned Ryan Gosling, but also Chris Evans, uh, Reggae Jean Page, Anna DeArmas, Michael Keaton, Kevin Costner. Um, you know, I've really kind of uh, been through a lot of those people. But um, I mean, I, I've my childhood, I've, I've never met Arnold Schwarzenegger yet, and I'd really like to. Yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to meet Michael Jackson, but it's too late. Yeah. So that's a, yeah. No, I heard I heard doing his music videos is like fascinating because he'll 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 look at every single little thing, especially towards the later years. He he was very uh, I guess micromanaging is the word. Uh, right. He, he definitely he looked at every single little thing. Okay. Um. So yeah, any uh, any hot takes on sound or anything you want to say about the world of sound uh, before we uh, conclude this interview and uh, send you on your way? Don't work for free ever. Don't work for free ever. Okay. Well, you know what? That's a good take. I like that take. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, this was Thomas Curley, Academy Award winning sound mixer, works such as Whiplash and Yellowstone. Uh, check him out on what's your website? I, I I have a website, curlysound.com, but it's it's really kind of more utilitarian than anything. It's just my resume and stuff. Okay. Um, but then, I'm on Instagram, uh, Tom Curly. Well, Tom underscore Curly underscore CAS um, or Facebook. Okay. All right. Tom, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll see you later. You bet. Thank you.